Hello and welcome to the Literature Life. In this video, we are going to talk about New Criticism, a reading approach that followed from the formalist movement of the 20th century. Now mind it, I called New Criticism not a literary theory, but a reading approach. That's what it was, a way of reading literature and not a consolidated unidirectional theoretical school. But in a way, new criticism may be called the mother of all future literary theories, but an accidental mother, so to say. Why an accidental mother, you will ask? New criticism did not actually give birth to the theories that came after it. Quite contrary to this, most of the theories that grew after new criticism were a reaction a challenge to the way new criticism approached literature. All right. Critics found that the way a possessive friend wants you to break up with that toxic guy. Uh, similarly, new criticism wanted to break up literature. It was possessive of literature and it wanted literature to break up with the society, to break up with history, to break up with the politics of the time, to break up with anything that concerned anything outside literary works. All right. So we can say that responses like reader response theory, new historicism, deconstruction, etc. These are the theories that developed as a reaction to new criticism. And this is the first thing we need to know about it. About this video, as you all requested, I have divided this into 10 major points, which cover the 10 main ideas that the new critics gave. As usual, every point has been described with ample examples so that you understand this easily. And I hope that you have fun while doing it. So let's begin. So let's see from where it all started. One fine day, a Cambridge University professor whose name today we know as I.A. Richards, gave his students some small lyric poems to critically analyze and comment upon. These were small pieces. Their average line count was 18 lines and the longest of them was 32 lines. While giving this task, Richards did a sneaky little clever thing. He removed the poet's name and any other historical or biographical detail that was given on the page. He removed them. And then he asked the students to critically analyze them. To Richard's utter disappointment, he found that his students' responses to the poems were vague, personal, impressionistic. Most of his students were not able to identify the nuances of the language used in those poems. Almost none of them had paid attention to the figurative language used by the poet, the devices used by the poet, and how the devices actually played a role in enhancing the meaning of the poem and enhancing the experience of reading a poem, which is a work of art and not a piece of journalism. In other words, None of the students had taken up what we today know as a close reading of the poems. Richards felt that what these students had done is not literary criticism, but a social gesture. He called it a social gesture, an attempt to praise the poem based on their personal views. This reflected that the discipline of English literary criticism at the time was not disciplined at all. It was chaotic, it was haphazard, and Richards felt that there was a desperate need to lay some ground rules in order to keep literature literary, in order to keep literary criticism neatly separated from history and biography. Meanwhile, similar events were happening in other parts of the world as well. In Canyon College in America, for example, a teacher known as John Crow Ransom and some of his students who are today the most renowned scholars of new criticism and their names are Alan Tate, Robert Penn Warren and Clint Brooks. These uh, scholars found similar gaps in the field of literary criticism and decided to do something about it. 
all these critics and many others like them decided to clearly define the role of a literary critic. They wanted to develop modes of reading which pay attention to the language of the text and the formal elements of the language. In this way, new criticism was an attempt to validate English literary criticism as a discipline governed by rules and systems and not by personal whims and fancies. So this is how it originated and this was a very short introduction to this approach. Let's now begin to understand what new criticism tried to change and how it tried to change it. So let's move on to our first point. A literary text is not just a reflection of the author's life or the spirit of the time in which it was produced. So before new criticism was developed as a methodology, the dominant approach of reading literature was a biographical historicist approach. According to this approach, reading a literary text or critiquing or analyzing it involved investigating two things. Number one, the historical political events that were happening at the time of its production. And number two, investigating the author's intentions from his personal documents, his letters, essays, diaries, or his biographies. This was used to make sense of what the work was trying to do and what was happening in the society at the time when it was produced. So as you can understand, with this approach, the text appeared to be a reflection of the historical events around it, and it ended up being understood merely as a tool to understand the spirit of the age or the expression of the author's psyche. Now let's take an example and try to figure out what was wrong with studying literature as a byproduct of the age or the byproduct of the author's dark secret mind. Louise Tyson, my favorite literary theory teacher, in her very helpful chapter on new criticism, mentioned that before new criticism, a teacher could come to the class to teach Wordsworth's elegiac stanzas, for example, discuss the French Revolution, the Romantic movement, Romantic literature, other Romantic poets, or Wordsworth's political and personal beliefs, his friends, his enemies, his lovers, his family, his habits, his education, and so on. And after discussing all of this, the teacher could wrap up the lecture saying that they have done in the class Wordsworth's elegiac stanzas. The poem in question has been covered even without opening the text in question. A poem by Wordsworth becomes the reflection of the spirit of the age or the author's biographical details or both. This manner of reading gave almost no importance to the language of the literary text. Reading a poem ended up being the study of the context rather than the study of a text, of an artistic literary text. It ended up being the study of factual details rather than appreciating or critiquing a piece of art. New criticism was an attempt to reform and systematize the discipline of literary criticism and to make it more focused on the literary rather than on the historical or biographical. But if literature was not the expression of the spirit of the age or the author's intention, then what was it? This brings us to the second point. According to New Criticism, a text is an individual entity with a stable, unified, central theme. The New Critics argued that a literary text is an autonomous being. It is a self-sufficient verbal artifact, or what W.K. Wimsatt, another new critic, calls it a verbal icon. So the new critics gave the principle of autonomy, which declares that a literary text is a self-sufficient entity. Its internal properties are enough to interpret it and judge it and critically analyze it. New critics maintain that a literary text, whether it's a poem, a story, play or a novel, it has an internal system of language. In this internal system of language, 
there's a relationship between the various parts and there's a relationship between the various techniques used by the author the various devices used by the author the various figurative tools used by the author there's a relationship between all of this and this makes it a system of language which is self sufficient it has inherent value it is unaffected by any exterior factors or material history this is what the new critics said and this is exactly where it invited criticism later on after the 1950s but we are not going there right now so just pay attention that the new critics said that a literary text is a self sufficient uh, being individual that is unaffected by any exterior factors or material history to believe that in order to understand a text we absolutely have to know about the political or personal beliefs of the author or what was going on in the world when the text was written is according to new critics a mistake let's take an example the new critics argue that when we read a text like milton's paradise lost we should keep in mind that no matter milton's political views his opposition to idolatry his radical religious standpoint of the time when we read paradise lost satan's rebellion against god should not be understood as milton's opposition to certain structures it should not be considered or confused with the poet's intentions all right they believe new critics believe that paradise lost as a work is an autonomous independent entity and if we read it closely pay attention to the language and the relationships between the various systems of language within the text the central theme that is the nature of human beings relationship to god will be revealed that there is a stable central theme which is in the text which the internal system of language will help you find if you read closely now the next point is perhaps the most important idea of this video the new critics argued that the language of a literary text is special and has the potential to reveal much more than we see on the page language new critics believed can be used in two main ways this was highlighted by i a richards two uses of language in which he distinguishes between referential and emotive language referential language or what i call non literary language is the practical matter of fact kind of language that we use in everyday life and we use to record historical and scientific facts whereas the emotive language has a purpose to evoke the emotional and intellectual faculties of the reader or the listener the purpose of non literary language is simple it wants to get the message across it is referential in the manner that it always refers to something outside of itself to get the message passed on but the purpose of emotive or literary language is to draw attention to itself to the artistic beauty of its existence so when a dentist holds his horrific looking drill in your mouth and asks you to sit still he is using referential language he is not asking you to observe his words and the beauty of his words and evaluate them he is definitely asking you not to move or you know what may happen and if he is a good dentist he will not use poetic language full of ambiguity and symbolism to ask you to sit still his message is clear and he wants you to understand it immediately so he is using referential language on the other hand when a poet writes thou still unravished bride of quietness the poet wants you to stop and think and enjoy the ambiguity of the word still in which he means that the bride the image of the bride on the grecian urn is still because she is a motionless image also she is still unravished which means that even after ages of the time that she was depicted on that urn she still has not consummated her love with her partner the word still also points to the fact 
that the bride on the urn is unravished by time, is still unravished by time and she looks as beautiful as she did ages ago. So, the multiplicity of meanings in the single word still is a matter of enjoyment. The reader is supposed to use his faculties to discern the suggestive use of language, to experience the poem's process of meaning making and to get the pleasure that only art can afford and not the dentist's instructions. So since literary and non-literary language have different natures, how can you use non-literary language to judge a literary work? A critic's job is to assess the value and merit of a work, to assess and value the literary art in the work. If he ignores the art, he ignores the expression, he ignores the purposefully defeminarized, nuanced and deliberate complexity of artistic language, he is not a literary critic at all because he is not paying attention to the literary elements of it. Right? So the new critics believed that we need to formulate this discipline, we need to lay some ground rules so that literary criticism is dependent upon literary factors and non-literary factors remain outside of the field of literary criticism. All right. So this brings us to the next point. What should a literary critic focus on according to new critics? Focus only on the words on the page. This single line can also be called the anthem of the new critical practice. This was the focus of their attention. They insist that in order to critique a poem or work of literature, a literary critic should not try to bring in facts from the outside world and must focus on the text and only the text itself. They need to focus on the form of the work. And what is the form of the work, you may ask? The form includes some teeny tiny details that an author leaves consciously or unconsciously within a literary or within an artistic work. This includes not just what the author has said, but also how he has said it. So judging a literary work without even paying attention to the hows of the language, like was done before New criticism is actually missing out on a very important aspect of literary criticism. It is like judging the proverbial book by its cover. The cover being the exterior facts, the form being the linguistic elements of the book that is of utmost importance. For example, don't we all love Shakespeare's Sonnet 18, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day? Of all the Shakespeare's sonnets, this one is most oft quoted and often most loved. What is it that makes Shakespeare's Sonnet 18 so amazing? Is it the social background? Is it Shakespeare's personal life? No, it's the literary language of the artistic work. Ask yourself, if you hadn't read the actual words of the sonnet, wouldn't you have missed on a very important experience as a literary scholar? The content is only this. You are better than everything and everyone. Big deal. People must text this to their beloveds all the time. But we don't see those texts in university curricula centuries after the writer's death. If someone tries to judge Shakespeare's Sonnet 18 according to the king of the time or the political climate of the time or Shakespeare's personal life and miseries and dilemmas, would you ever be close to knowing the immense beauty and joy you feel after reading the sonnet? It is the form of a work. It is the beauty he creates by comparison and juxtaposition and the hyperbole and the metaphor and the rhyme scheme, the personification of death. All of this, along with the work's concept, make it a great work. Literary critics should focus on the words on the page and need no external details if the work itself is well written. This is what new critics insist on the most. However, only good form doesn't make good art. And this brings us to the next point, that form and content are inseparable. What makes great literature great? 
what makes literature literary it is the fusion of beautiful form and thoughtful content it is the fact that in addition to having relevant thoughtful defamiliarized content elements it also has beautiful complex rich layered defamiliarized patterns of formal elements also the pleasure and experience we get out of reading great literature is because both the content and the form work together in a harmony to create that sublime experience of reading which gives us the pleasure of watching an artistic work or listening to a great song by an artist and of course reading a good work of literature so to judge the quality of a work a literary critic must consider the relevance seriousness and universal appeal of the content while closely tracing the formal clues left there by the author such a critic is an informed critic he is not impressionistic and vague about his judgments he does his analysis by closely observing both the form and the content of the work take for example an elegy written on a country churchyard by thomas gray despite being a poem with a personal message why is it still considered one of the best poems in the english language it's because it has beautiful language it is simple its rhyme scheme rhythm is simple and lines like the plowman homeward plods his weary way initiates the actual walking of a farmer and the repetition of the hard d sound reflects the hard nature of his work and the transferred epithet in weary way which literally means a tired path but actually refers to the farmer's tiredness while going back after a hard day of work all of this creates a beauty in the language while its thoughtful ideas like the paths of glory lead but to the grave point to an exalted serious universally relevant truth all of this finally reveals the central theme of the poem which is the transitory nature of human life and the inevitability of death and death as a great equalizer we know all of this even though we do not consider that gray wrote it as an elegy to his friend or what was the historical details of the time we pay no attention to that and still we are able to get so much of pleasure out of this po- piece of poetry and we get such a sublime message out of this piece of poetry and we can cre- uh, go on about the beauty of its linguistic elements and the beauty of its content even though we pay no attention to the historical details or the personal details of the po- uh, the poet therefore literary art and criticism should focus on the expression of a meaningful experience by merging of a universally relevant subject in an aesthetically appealing form one without the other is meaningless and when they both merge they create great art according to the new critics what else makes a literary work great according to new critics they say and that's the sixth point great literary works have a combination of complexity and order and this complexity and order and the balance of it gives the work an organic unity i know this sounds complicated but hear me out and uh, listen to the examples and you'll certainly understand this so new critics believe that in a great work of literary art various levels of complexities function to express a unified theme so there's a complexity between the various figurative linguistic uses of language but they are directed towards finding a stable theme so there's a balance the complexity is balanced by the simplicity all the words and phrases and metaphors and images and symbols etc have a relationship to each other but they also have a relationship to the main purpose of the work which is to express the unified theme 
So this idea was given by the romantic poet S.T. Coleridge and the new critics took it from him. This is what Coleridge called a poem's power to elicit delight as a whole but also as distinctive gratification from each component part. We get a delight by reading the work but we also get a delight by how the various devices are used in relation to each other, how the various complexities are presented in a connection to each other and what is the connection all of them are trying to find a unified theme this connection gives the work an organic unity all right so let's figure out how complexities work in a work of literature formalism as a school especially has been greatly impressed by the idea of complexity of art we know that right good works of art make you jolt out of your present state of mind they shock you by presenting common things in an uncommon form this is a formalist idea this is close to what they called defamiliarization the formalists called defamiliarization or estrangement so when the speaker in john dunn's the sun rising only wants to say that I want some more time in bed with my beloved. He starts the poem by saying, busy old fool, unruly son. And this inserts a dramatic element and creates a complexity, shocks the readers out of their complacent state. Similarly, Andrew Marvel's speaker into his coy mistress, rather than saying, hurry up girl, we don't have much time, says that, your virgin body will be eaten by worms when it's dead, so you better hurry up. So it presents an image, the poem presents an image, the speaker presents an image which shocks you out, shocks the readers out of their complacent present state. This is one way of creating complexity and shocking readers. On another level, all the devices that reveal themselves are all sneaky little but artistic ways in which a literary artist uses language and its systems to create a complexity that gives good literary art its value. The working together of metaphors, symbols, illusions, paradoxes and the creation of ambiguity and irony and tension in the text, this creates a kind of complexity that delays and complicates meaning. Also, when we analyze a work closely, it is possible that the internal evidence leads us to a number of different meanings and these multiple, multiple meanings, the multiplicity of meanings creates a complexity, all right? But in great literary works, new critics believe, all these different layers of complexity direct toward a single, stable, central theme of the text. Thus, we can say, that all the complexities created by the language of the text are still guided by an order. And what is the order? Everything is pointed towards a central theme. All these complexities create a central tension which is resolved at the end of the work and expresses its central theme. The various parts of the work fall in together as a whole. This gives the work an organic unity, a vitality, like living organisms. For example, in Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, the mode of narrative, which is stream of consciousness, it creates complexity along with the coming together of the stories of so many characters through so many motives. The settings are different, so many symbols are used, uh, but all of this complexity expresses one single theme. The modern condition, the emptiness and alienation which shrouds the life of an individual in the modern times. It is the merging of the various devices, various complexities and the order to seek a central theme that keeps the readers hooked and makes Mrs. Dalloway a good piece of art. So you see how in various ways the amalgamation of the complexity and order, the amalgamation of the parts and the whole, the amalgamation of the specific with the universal human condition, great literary art achieves an organic unity. And thus new critics tell you what to do to systematize the field of literary criticism. But what about things not to do? So the next point brings us to that. And the next point is, steer away from fallacies. What are fallacies, you ask? 
A fallacy is an invalid mode of reasoning. So when you arrive on a conclusion by taking wrong facts into account, your conclusion is obviously bound to be wrong. To look at the flat floor in front of us and to declare that the whole earth must be flat is a fallacy. The ground of reading, pun intended, is false and hence the fallacy. New critics maintained that paying too much attention to the intention of the author, to what the author is trying to mean, uh, what he's trying to say, what is his intention, is to confuse the poem with its origin, which is the author. Wimsatt and Beardsley, prominent new critics, called this error intentional fallacy. The new critics argue that the intention of the author is neither available nor desirable. It is not available because the author does not leave back explanations and contexts and the references to his art. And even if it's available, the meaning that the work was able to express may be far more richer, more complex, layered and deeper than the poet actually intended. Alright, so the intended meaning and the achieved meaning may be different. So the new critics believe that the author and the speaker of a work are different entities and should be considered different individuals. This idea is inspired by T.S. Eliot's idea of impersonality of a poet when he declares that a great poet does not reveal his own personality in his art. And for further details about this, you can also watch my video on T.S. Eliot's theory of impersonality. So in short, Trying to Sherlock Holmes into the author's intention gives the literary critic no relevant insights about the text. Focus on the words on the page you twit, said every new critic ever. In a similar manner, if a literary critic is trying to judge the merits and literary value of a work by observing the emotions it evokes in a reader, it is called affective fallacy. So, for example, the sonnet 18 may evoke the emotions of love and beauty in some readers who have partners. Some others who are utterly alone may find a sense of emptiness in the sonnet since their loved ones are not with them. In some others, it may raise existential questions about the fleeting nature of human life and the certainty of death. So how will a literary critic judge the value of a literary work when the nature and intensity of the work's impact is different on different readers? So literary criticism shouldn't be dependent upon the intention of the author or the mood of the reader. Literary art, as we established in the second point, is timeless, autonomous, independent of all these external factors. The author and the reader are outside the literary text. They are beyond the words on the page of the text, beyond the boundaries of the system of language, which is the text. Paying attention to them will lead to chaos and that will hamper the systematization of literary criticism. So I hope you understood what the new critics are asking you to avoid. Don't fall into the fallacies. Another thing they want you to avoid is paraphrasing. So let's go to the next point, which explains that. For the new critics, a text is like a living organism. We've already established that, right? Just like you can't casually take an ear or an eye or a hand away from a person, you can't take even a comma away from a literary work or you will not have the, in, the exact same work. The work is changed even if you take away a comma or a period or a word. The way you can't clothe some stranger in your sister's clothes and consider that stranger your sister, similarly, when you translate or paraphrase a work, the entire work is changed. It's not the same work, according to new critics. This is why the new critics coined the term heresy of paraphrase. Yes, you heard it right. They equated paraphrasing words of one work into similar or more familiar words with blasphemy as something that is equated with betrayal. Instead of saying, the plowman homeward plods his weary way, if you, instead of saying this, you say, the plowman plods his weary way homeward. See, the joy and the rhythm and the music of the original words is gone. By replacing even one simple word with another, the entire delight that we were getting out of that phrase is gone. 
New critics believed that even a comma, even a point, the arrangement of lines in the poem, the space between the lines, everything about the poem makes it what it is. And a good literary critic is not concerned with what a poem says, but what it is as an individual entity. This is a very short point and that's all I wanted to indicate. Uh, but I included this with two reasons. Number one, I didn't want you guys to miss the important term heresy of paraphrase. And number two, I wanted to insist and stress how much importance the new critics assigned to each and every minutest and tiniest element of the form of the text. Now we come to the ninth and 10th points, which are much simpler because these don't really explain away new criticism. We have established the major arguments and aspects of the approach by now. So let's cover the ninth point, which is questions new critics ask. So by now, I know that you have become experts of new critics parameters of judging a text. So you may pause and think of some questions that new critics may ask. But if you want to see some examples, I'm giving you a short list. So here we go. What do the words on the page of a work express? What internal evidence does the text provide to guide its readers? All right, pay attention that we are not using the word author, but the text. The author provides nothing to the new critics and the text provides everything. Next question. What are the formal elements that the work uses in order to forward the narrative and reveal its central theme? How do the formal elements reveal multiple meanings and express the complexity of good literary art? Do all these meanings direct us towards an order, a balance, a central theme? How do the formal elements enrich the experience of reading a text and add value to the text? What is the interrelationship between the devices that function within the text? For example, how do the metaphors, similes, images, symbols, rhyme, rhythm, personification, alliteration, all of this creates a tension that resolves into the central theme of the poem. How is the process of meaning making deferred and complicated by the use of ambiguity, irony and paradox? How these separate parts are employed to function together to work in an organic unity that create the greatness of the work. So these were some examples of the questions that new critics may ask or new critical analysis may ask. And finally, we come to why new critics faced so much criticism. All right. So no matter how much the new critics were thinking in the favor of literary studies, no matter how many good reading methods and ideas they gave us about literary criticism, new criticism was actually a very conservative ideology. By focusing on the words on the page only and by considering everything that is outside the text as an unwanted nuisance, new critics underestimated the potential of a literary text to challenge and to disturb the status quo, to change and impact society. In the new critical methodology, a literary text was divorced from the social and historical context in which it may otherwise function meaningfully. All right, what if the text was written with the purpose of bringing about a change in the social condition, the social attitude of the time? For example, Maya Angelou's poem, Caged Bird, the poem is a moving expression of the helplessness and the loss of agency that segregation and racism had caused. And within the text, Angelou makes no mention of slavery or discrimination or African-American history. But if we read the poem only as a bird's yearning for freedom, don't we miss out on an important political implication? Don't we miss out on experiencing the depth of an unfortunate problem? And even though we can come to several valid meanings and a central theme from the words on the page, missing out on even one of such important interpretations is a huge loss to a reader who restricts himself only to the words on the page. So we can see how new criticism resulted in the depoliticization of literary texts and dehistoricization of the literary text. Also, the new criticism methodology was limited in its scope. It was suitable only for small length poetry, especially lyric poetry. 
poets and authors that were suitable were picked and the others were ignored because the theory was not applicable to them. This restricted the scope of analysis of this approach. All right? And how can any approach afford to ignore the reader? Soon after the death of new criticism, the death of the author was declared by Roland Barthes. Reader response criticism was established and it established the reader as one of the most important agents in a literary work. Some people also consider new criticism as a desperate attempt after the world war and the chaos it had caused to isolate literature and to provide an escape to a normal mind into something that was not political. So some people also call new criticism as a psychological escape theory. So the list of the shortcomings of new criticism goes on and on. In short, it was a good method to read literature, but it had to be treated just like that. It was a good reading practice, but could not be the only reading practice to interpret a work of literature. After close reading, we need to expand our view and take other factors into consideration if we wish to have a wider view of the work, if we wish to understand the real world politics, real world problems, the ideological implications of literary texts and their function in the society. I must mention before wrapping this video up that new criticism was not a consolidated school or a unified literary theory. It was scattered and the new critical recommendations were not always in a unified direction. And despite the criticism that new criticism has received from academics world over, we have to acknowledge that the new critics still played an important part in trying to systematize the field of literary criticism. They tried to develop an empirical way of reading literature and helped in sensible literary analysis. No matter which theory or approach we take to analyze it, it always begins with a close reading of the text. And that's the contribution of new criticism that still leaves on decades after its demise. So guys, we've reached the end of this video. If this video helped you and you think I should continue making videos like this, please consider subscribing to my channel and giving this video a thumbs up. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the time and effort you gave to this. Thank you so much. Have a great day.